Savior is played on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices as the heaven had We have 10 um, 6th to 12th graders at the youth conference, and then we have four of our leaders there, and they've been having an amazing time. Um, the first night, I know Hannah asked them um, if any of them had the chance to experience God's presence during the worship. Um, they usually have like a pretty extended worship time at this conference, and um, all 10 of them raise their hands. So we're really excited that Jesus has met them where they are, and we're excited to see their stories when they come back and just kind of really hear about some of the healings they experienced. And the youth conference is one of my favorites to watch because, you know, these kids have, for being as fearful as we can be as teenagers, because you know we have all the self-esteem stuff like that, they are not afraid to go pray for one another. So if somebody is, if they see God is moving on somebody and somebody is weeping or really experiencing the presence, there's like a flock of kids that are just all over them and laying hands on them and giving them encouraging words. And so, um, and I was checking on the youth leaders the first night too, kind of seeing how they were going or the next morning, because it's rough being the youth leader because you like the midnight one o'clock thing and then nobody's sleeping and they're all drinking like Mountain Dew at one in the morning. And, it's just, it's a little rough. And so I was checking on him Saturday morning to see how it was going. And um, 
And I told her, I said, it's a youth conference, but Holy Spirit does not leave leaders out. Um, and so they were telling me some cool God stories that they had had from the night before as well. So we're really excited about what's happening there. Um, one of the announcements we have for this morning, um, just if you haven't been here before, there is a gift out front. There's a little um, stand out there that has a cup with like a free music download um, and usually a local coupon in there. So if you want to grab one of those on your way out, um, that's our gift to you. And then if you have to go to the bathroom, you just keep going through doors and eventually you'll find the restrooms. Um, and then sometimes there's dance music happening on the way. If you want to dance, you're more than welcome to because that's always fun. The kids like it. Um, Again, though, with all of our spiritual disciples being out, our kids' ministry is really tricky to get today, too. Um, trivia. So, softball is trying to raise some money. Um, as a church, we've donated a basket for them to help raise some money, and that is happening. Is that next? No, two weeks. The 29th. Okay. So, the 29th, we're having that. Um, is it going to be at the high school? Yeah. Okay. So we are looking to get a team together. The church is willing to pay your fees. So if that's something you're interested in, you can grab your Connect card. They are either in the seat back or in the baskets that are around. And if you want to be on the team or if you're interested in anything or if you're new, we'd like for you to fill one of those out and put that in the offering bags as they pass by later. Um, next Sunday, we have a core team meeting right after church. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Jim Agley came down and preached a while back. Was it on missions? It was on, I don't know. He's coming back again next week, along with Johnny has the message next week as well. Um, and he's going to share some of the stuff that's happened in Africa with their last trip. It sounds really exciting what's been happening there. So um, we're going to have him. He'll be there for part of our core team meeting too, so get questions to ask because they're, um, what they do for missions as just making disciples in the coast of Africa and reconciling Muslims back to Jesus is kind of completing the circle, that's the partnership that we're going to be going with. And so core team is next Sunday. You're welcome to come. Anybody, anybody who feels like this is your church or you're interested or you want to partner with what we're doing, then next Sunday after church, be here. And then the last announcement I think I have is baptism it is next month. So March 22nd. We're going to have the tank up here. We're going to be doing baptisms. We do that while we worship. It's a pretty celebratory experience. So if you're interested in that, put that on the card. Uh, we'll be reaching out to you. I need to get a piece of paper so I can get your shirt sizes so we can order your shirts. Um, and it's just a really fun celebration time. So one other thing I will announce, I don't have a slide for it, that next Sunday, March 29th, we're going to have um, basically a worship lab instead of a church service that Sunday. So all the kids will be in here with us. We're gonna have family worship and we're gonna have some different stations where you can try different types of worship, maybe um, painting, prophetic art during worship, or um, maybe you try like resting during worship, or maybe you actually try raising your hands during worship. And so it kind of gives you a chance to experience some different expressions. And that'll be the last Sunday in March. So I think that's it for announcements. If Evan, you want to go ahead and come up. Evan has our message for this week for the love of others. Like, it's up there. Leading the youth trip, I don't know, we were early in our marriage, it was like 19, 20 or so. And there's, and there's always a, yeah, if we got married young, um, maybe, maybe you guys can't connect with that. <laughs> we were super young, we were leading a, a youth trip as, as youth leaders, and youth leaders were in Springfield, and we had a quick trip to Subway and had to get back to the conference, so I was driving the, the 15 passenger van and backed out and backed right into the rear taillight of a Cadillac. The ones with the big arched, arched taillight and just completely just cracked the whole thing. It was this moment of, we're going to be late now. Do I just, no one saw me do this. Do I just leave and get back to the youth conference or, or go in and find the, you know, the older couple that belongs to this Cadillac? So I go to 
Like this is this is time to demonstrate ethics and responsibility to the youth. So park the van, go inside, find the people. They come out. The, the husband's furious. He's like, they could they don't they wouldn't want to talk to me. They just pull the pull the phone, call the police right away. Then the police show up and then yell at them and say, This is less than five hundred dollars damage. Why'd you even bother being them, you know, send us on our way and everything? But and that's my that's my remembrance of youth trips is that <laughs> a chance to demonstrate demonstrate what it looks like to uh, to look like look like God and take responsibility for things. Yes. Oh, I switch over the computer. Oh. I almost gave away. Can you switch the source over? It's got yes, this whole month we're doing uh, a message on for the love of God, for the love of... I can't remember the second one. I mean, Danelle did a good job going into the ideas of men and women, the roles of that. This is for the love of others, but this specific focus on marriage and uh, I went ahead and look at this focus on the kingdom of God and marriage together is the highlight of it. I want to start off with the story because it's always more fun. Look at the story that way. It's good. We're good. All right. Maybe. There we go. Meet Vicky. <clears throat> so Grew up a long, long time ago. Some people can connect with this idea of growing up. Uh, she grew up and her, her dad died whenever she was really young. So grew up in a single parent household and was just always all over the place, not really in a constant place necessarily, which is something we're seeing more and more often, where we don't have two parents to be able to model what marriage looks like. So that was what her childhood looked like this back. So, there, there was one other kind of unique characteristic about her life, though, was that when she reached 18, she became the Queen of England. Uh, it wasn't your normal growing up experience. This is Queen uh, Victoria. So you think of Victorian era of England, this is the lady they were talking about. So at the age of 18, we're after, you know, kind of a rough go for England, England's in this 1800s early time frame where there's debate about what role does the monarchy even play in, in the world anymore? What role would they really play in the, in, the, in the life of England necessarily? And now all of a sudden they have an 18 year old who's now queen, responsible for the whole show. And it was a, it was a rough go of it, and she was getting started. Can you imagine being 18 and all of a sudden you've just been thrust into, and it wasn't, it wasn't like she was expecting this to happen. There was two other people in line that were supposed to take the place as king or queen ahead of her, and they both passed away. So all of a sudden you got two people that passed away, which is an unlikely scenario, and this 18-year-old steps in and becomes queen, and is now responsible for modeling and leading the entire nation, and is not really prepared for that. Didn't grow up with a dad, didn't really see her mom much, she was kind of off on her own, she was with you know, tutors and mentors and off on her own, so it was just this whole lifestyle, like, how am I supposed to do this? Within a couple of years, uh, I think about two years or so, she marries Prince Albert. I don't have a photo. There's some photos of it, but I said the paintings a bit better. Um, uh, interesting thing was that uh, there's two interesting side notes to her getting married. One is she set a trend for weddings from that point forward. Does anyone know this little trivia bit? In terms of fashion, Queen Victoria changed the face of marriage for all of us. A white wedding gown wasn't really a thing until that point. So having a white wedding gown at the at the marriage at the wedding was actually something that Queen Victoria set into motion and uh, which led to you know, say yes to the dress. So TLC is very thankful for Queen Victoria on that. Um, the other interesting thing is that she proposed to Prince Albert. Uh, being the queen, it was not possible for someone to propose to the queen. There's you know some rules against that, some protocol against that. So she actually proposed to Prince Albert, who happened to be a, a cousin of Along the line, I'm sure how close it actually was. So, ends up marrying Prince Albert. Here's the unique thing about their their marriage. If you can imagine the dynamics, so men in the room, imagine you you get proposed to by a queen. And now all of a sudden, you're not technically king. You're still just prince. There's this clear separation of what your role and responsibility is, and you're not you're not ruling necessarily. She is the ruler. She's the one that's making responsibilities and roles for the whole government. That's a very, uh, I'll use a big academic term, emasculating uh, position to be in, which and you don't really have a whole lot of authority or control necessarily. And so in that, it'd be very easy to kind of take a step back, 
be like, hey, you know what, I'm just here for the great food and the cheese and, you know, the free trips around and she does her thing and I get all the benefits of being part of the kingdom. This is an awesome gig. I'm just going to do nothing. That's not how Prince Albert lived. That's not what he did. He actually became her most trusted advisor. The amount of influence that he actually had was to some degree kind of unheard of. It wasn't really, that's the way things went before. She trusted him. She leaned on him. He was actually very politically savvy. And uh, they made a lot of him, they made a lot of really big uh, improvements to the country and kind of shaped the way the country is really focused and, and, and led through that kind of nature. And not only were they great at the affairs of state, they had a lot of kids. Nine children in total. Nine kids. And at this time, it wasn't really common for all children to survive. So, kids, right? You're in a lucky time period where all of you get to make it through life. But this time in history, it's pretty common for families to lose children. There's multiple children along the way. All of their children made it into adulthood, which wasn't common as well. And obviously, they had a little bit of help being able to raise their children. It wasn't just what we might have, or particularly in America, in American culture, we are responsible for doing everything ourselves. That was one of the nice things when we lived overseas is being able to have extra help and support. I never paid utility bills. We had people in our office that would be like, hey, can you go pay this utility bill? They paid the utility bill for us. We had someone that we hired to help clean our house. You had to clean your house every day because you just get sick. It still got sick even having the house help. So it was just one of us having extra help around. So there's help there. Their kids, nine children, ended up having 42 grandchildren. She's known as the grandmother of Europe. All these kids went on to be able to either marry in or lead other countries and nations, and either in top positions, military positions, have strong influence over the healthcare, whatever, some notable influence. There's just all kinds of things that came out of their relationship that impacted not just their own nation, but all the nations around them as well. 42 grandchildren that pushed all these really roles. It was really, really interesting. Unfortunately, um, it wasn't just you know, this really great marriage that they just went off in the sunset and sat on the porch at the end of their time and enjoyed that. Whenever uh, Albert was 40 or so, he ended up passing away. Uh, so Queen Victoria is known as the, the Widow of Windsor, and she was in a period of mourning that was a pretty long period of mourning. It ended up being four decades of mourning. She never remarried. Her, the connection that she had to Albert was so strong. She said, there's a quote saying, like, without him, life is just kind of meaningless. It lost its meaning. There's, they did everything together. The decisions that she made as queen, she did them with Albert. And whenever he passed away, she, she stayed involved. She did what she needed to do, but a lot of the other, you know, the typical pomp and circumstance of going to a wedding and going to affairs and, and making public appearances kind of went away and she focused on what she needed to do. She also made so many decisions at that point for her to think about, you know, how did Albert view the world? What was his worldview? That they really truly made decisions together as one. And she wanted to kind of honor that. This idea of, of, a, of a marriage, of a relationship that transcended the death of her own spouse, which most of us probably don't even think about that or think about you know, what, what would you do if your spouse passed away? Would you remarry or not? Or are your lives so combined and connected together that you'd be able to know what the other person would do 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40 years down the line to really keep that person's memory alive and say, like, no, we still live as one person necessarily. So it's not super common to be able to have, to see that level of commitment anymore in terms of the way that people live. But I got another question. All right, so the next question. Why do we get married? I like interactivity. So it may not be why you got married. I mean, I got married because my wife is hot. <laughs> and I was 19 at the time, so there was the criteria. No, there was a lot of other reasons. So why did you get married? Why do people in general get married? John, you always got me. Loneliness, yeah. Have that partnership. Have that person that would live 40 years without you to mourn you, just to think you're that cool, to be willing to say like there's no one that can compare to you. That's you know, it's that love story. What else? Why else could get married? It's it's what you do. It's like the progression, this life cycle thing that we do. You, you get mature. You get married. You have children. 
hopefully it all stays together. And then, you know, the children from Mauritius is a religious group. We're keeping population at its proper level by doing this. It's our, it's our responsibility. What are the ideas coming on? Yeah, help, right? I guess someone else needs to do the dishes. I don't want to do this wrong necessarily. I mean, yeah, I'm either bad at house chores, I'm bad at cooking, or I don't know how to fix my own car, or whatever those scenarios are, kind of throw in those, these aspects of, in general, a lot of times, or, um, you guys are really depressing. No one said love here yet. Okay, no, no, no one this thing like, oh, I actually love another person. I want to spend most of the time that we've done kind of jump right to some of the tangible things of, now, loneliness is a part of it. Like, I'm, I'm feeling lonely. I, I want someone, I need someone to love in my life and connect with them. And I think generally that's what we see is that we've put benefits over purpose. We think about what does marriage bring to me necessarily, or what does marriage bring to, or my, my responsibility or you know, the benefits that I bring to society through marriage and the purpose of it. Some good news. Good news is that the overall divorce rate in the U.S. has been going down. So generally, what we quote from the stage, and it's a, what's the percentage we always hear? 50%, 50% divorce rate. It's not even close to that anymore. According to some recent stats, it's more like an 18, 20% range. Um, now there's also another reason for the divorce rate being so low. People are not getting married as much either. So the marriage rate has been declining, especially amongst people 30 and below. Uh, people are getting married a lot less often, which means people living together has gone up a lot considerably over the last 20 years or so. So we're like, yeah, how do we just like, you know, I still want the benefits of marriage and I don't even understand or care what the purpose is anymore. I don't even believe in marriage anymore. Now the divorce rate amongst people more of the seniors to boomer age has been going up a lot, which doesn't help this overall trend for saying, hey, marriage is great, you should do it because that's what a lot of younger adults are seeing. They're looking down the road, they're looking at their parents and their grandparents, they're not happy, they're getting divorced at an increasing rate. They're saying, you know what? There's actually an article about a year ago in the Wall Street Journal just saying like, the concept of marriage is just outdated. It's just an institution that served its purpose at one time, but we don't really need it anymore, which is incredibly depressing. So there's, there's a lot of work that we need to do to be able to come back and say, all right, what is the purpose of marriage? So here's a quick, quick definition. So I drew a lot from a book by Tony Evans about kingdom marriage, and I'm going to dive into a little bit concept, talking about the kingdom of God here in a moment, because it's just, it's fundamental, it's a huge part of it, is that that's one of the reasons why it exists, you know, like marriage exists to glorify God extending his rule and his reach over the earth. And that's why I start off with the story of Queen Victoria. It's like that's one of those examples of a couple that through their marriage was able to have influence upon not just their children, but also upon their entire country. And not just their country, but their entire continent that they were on. And actually, there, some of their children came over and were, were leaders in Canada as well. So there's this influence globally that happened through their marriage. Like, well, that's, you know, that's expected because they're those, they're that very small percentage of human beings that operate and live in that world with that capacity. You know, you and I are not kings and queens of any particular nation. But that's really that, that thing we need to start thinking about a little bit more is that if this definition is true, that marriage exists to glorify God, extend his rule, extend his reach into the world, that means that we're a part of something bigger, right? We're a part of the kingdom of God. And that's what we miss out on. We, we just, we, we read the Bible. So last month we had a whole series diving into like, what's the story of the Bible? And how do we read this better? How do we know this better? And I grew up, I grew up in an amazing experience of a home church where my mom and dad were co-pastors. And we would have people in our home every single week, so most of twice a week. And we'd have really extended times of worship where, yeah, I grew up experiencing the power of God. And as a tween participating in exorcisms, 
with people that would come in. Like it was not your normal church experience growing up. So in extended times of Bible studies and seeing, you know, just the the depth of the kingdom of God, the symbolism in scripture. So it's really cool stuff. But it wasn't really until my twenties that the idea that the the kingdom of God is not just a cute parable, story, fable thing that's kind of woven into the Bible just so we can learn it a little bit better. It's an actual kingdom. When Jesus walked around and said, like, I am the king of the world, and the kingdom of God is like this, and the kingdom of heaven is like this, those weren't just analogies. So we're like, okay, I get it. He's, you know, he's kind of like a king. We can kind of relate to that. Because we don't understand, in America specifically, we didn't, we didn't handle kingdom very well. The idea of a king ruling over us as Americans, we're kind of like, you know what? We don't want that. Queen Vicky, your uncle, you can just take that back. We don't want your tax tea and kick you out. We want to be independent. So we are fiercely independent. We love our own sovereignty. We love to be able to do things. We love to be able to incorporate the elements of Jesus and the elements of the Bible that we want into our lives. And that's just part of our, our heritage, our DNA as, as a culture. It's part of American culture. Other countries aren't necessarily like that. Other countries have active kings and queens and monarchs that are still involved in things. I think the, the king of Thailand recently died. In, in Thailand, the role of the king, the influence of the king is huge. A lot of other countries, you can take a picture, this is what we lived in a lot. When you picture other countries, picture the traffic in other countries. What does the traffic in a developing country in your mind look like? Orderly, quiet, it's chaotic, right? Complete chaos, cars weaving and out, honking all the time, traffic jams. So the, the king of Thailand took a trip one time to another country, and he was like, hey, these people aren't honking all the time like they do in Thailand. It's kind of nice. All the honking in our country is really annoying. So he comes back and says, no more honking. Guess what happened in Thailand? All the honking pretty much stopped. All the countries around it, Cambodia, and Vietnam and Myanmar and all those places, same same experience, the same thing we saw in Nepal. Like, there's just honking all the time. It's like, hey, I'm coming, or hey, I'm the way. Thailand is it's just quiet. Because of one statement from the king, not really just part of this, you know, setting rules. It's just, you know, there's just a great respect for that. That's what we're called to as well, is that we actually are part of the kingdom of God, and Jesus has given us this role that we're supposed to be playing in life, but we don't realize that. And that should have a profound impact upon our marriages as well. Is that we're specifically giving a, a, a charter. Now as Danelle joked, we go back to what book do we always go to starting off a sermon to make a case for Genesis. Genesis. Here we go. So Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, even, is where all this kind of kicks off. Uh, which is interesting, I use this verse and I talk about business as well, because it applies to business, it applies to marriage, it applies to everything. So Genesis chapter 1, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. He said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. A lot of times this is referred to as the Dominion mandate. So we think about why we're here. A lot of times when people talk about we were created to worship. We're created to worship God. That's what we're created to do. That's not what that says. Now are we supposed to be worshipful as we live? Absolutely. We're supposed to be recognizing the sovereignty of God and bringing glory to God the things that we do. But this is literally God said this is what you're responsible to do on the earth. I created you. I created you male and female, because guys can't figure it out on their own, and women can't figure it out on their own. You have to be able to do this thing together. God created Adam, and he had this nature of, obviously, Eve inside of him, but it wasn't enough just for one. It was this idea there has to be these two in order for this truly to represent what God wanted to represent on the earth. And it wasn't just to hang out and worship. 
They were working in the garden, taking, being fruitful, and increasing in number, filling the earth and subduing it. So being together, working, having children, growing the influence that they have, and subduing the earth. So the, God made the earth and everything was good. He made men and women. He said, this is really very good. He was super happy with what was there, but it wasn't complete. So you know, we hear about climate change, how we're destroying everything on the earth right now. And it'd be better if humans didn't exist based on these one kind of view of life that we have. And then there's the other extreme where we can just kind of do whatever we want. It wasn't really until I wrapped my head around the idea that the kingdom of God is real and that we have responsibility to do amazing things on the earth to make it better, that the idea of being conscious and caring about the earth is actually biblical. It's not so, I, I, I teach business, right? I love business, pro-capitalism in many ways. But there's also this idea is that we need to be very responsible on how we do things, and we do it, but we are responsible for actually making things better. And taking authority over the earth, and taking authority, now we're not necessarily given authority over people. And if we read through Jesus' teachings, you'll see that we're not really put, because in reality, our marriages are not unlike Victorian Alberts, that we are to put on the earth, kind of with the same tasks that they're responsible for, filling the earth, being fruitful, multiplying, having children, and subduing and taking authority over areas and regions and making things better. So yeah, I say, well, that, 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 that example doesn't apply to me, it does apply to us, because we are a part of a kingdom, and we have been given authority, we've been given a charge with accomplishing something. So we have, that's what we've been given. And things have just worked out really great for us since then. We have had no problems living this out. It's just gone really, really smoothly. There's so many pictures of this on, on Google. Right? And there's weird things about Satan wasn't a snake. I don't know. I didn't dive into those articles to say, what does, this is a whole other rabbit trail. Anyways, Satan didn't show up on the scene trying to derail this, which I found interesting, right? So Adam was there, he was naming all the animals. At any point, Satan could have showed up and say, what's better, a fight against two or a fight against one? Generally, we think, hey, we got one single person, he's obviously kind of lonely and uh, needs some help. Why didn't Satan show up then? Now all of a sudden, we got Adam and Eve on the scene, and God's giving us dominion to take over the earth and fill the earth with goodness and subdue it and extend his rule over the entire, all of a sudden, Satan's like, this is a problem. I have to interject into this now. This is my time to step up and say, let's see if we can mess with this. And he did, right? And there's obviously an impact that he had on us because of that. But that's not the way it's supposed to go out, that we are trying to be living out um, our lives in that particular way that, that brings glory to God and actually extends the kingdom of God across the earth. And then wove sit into a tree, and you know, same person's made that. All right, so here's the next thought. Next thought. The closer that our marriages are tied to the kingdom, everything else falls into place. We we flip, we do this with so many things, is that we take something that's good and we flip the order of it, or we get so enamored or so in love with a piece of it, and the, the priorities kind of fall out of, out of, out of, out of whack. That, yes, we do want companionship. Yes, we do want someone that loves, to, someone to love and someone that loves us. We do want someone that'll help us with the dishes and fix the car and do these things. All those benefits that we actually get out of marriage come when we remember what our purpose truly is. Just like with anything, I was, whenever, I, whenever I work with a business and I help them organizationally, or work on profit, or work on whatever it is they're working on, all those things fall into place after we go back and look at our, why does your organization, why does your company exist? What's your purpose? What's your mission? What are you trying to accomplish? What are you asking people to join you in doing? When that purpose is clear, all these decisions that we have to be making, and the focuses that we're having, and how we do things, they start to make a lot more sense. Where do we go for vacation? What type of home do we live in? 
How do we raise our children? What do we want our children to know? That, yeah, we all have this overall purpose that even though it's been affected and tainted by the fall and by sin entering the world, that's still our calling. This is still what we're tasked to do. This is still it. This hasn't changed. This is what all will be there. Is that all of us, whether we're married or will be married in the future, is that we're stepping into this role saying, that's my job, is to bring the kingdom of God to the earth. Tangibly. Making things better. Subduing it. So the closer that I can tie my marriage to what the kingdom of God is asking and expecting me to do, all those things that I really want my marriage to look like and to feel like and to be like are more, more likely to happen rather than pursuing something else. When we pursue happiness, be happy. I just want to focus on trying to be happy. I want to, all my students at Eastern now, a lot of us, my kids think this is funny too. They'll have them write things about themselves and then compare themselves to like specific values and, and ethics and principles and things like that for extra credit and say, no, one of these days I'm going to find myself, you know, like really find myself. Which means what? Oh, there I am. Like, okay, yeah. okay, you're here. So you find yourself. What does it mean to really find yourself? Or we're pursuing happiness. When we're pursuing happiness, we're focusing on being happy. What we find generally is we get happier. No, we find the exact opposite. When we focus on happiness, we end up finding that we are way less happy. We find all the reasons why we're not happy. Then we focus on those things that are making us not happy. Then we, even, we may even be like, oh, I'm be proactive about doing this, and then I'll be happy. Then we do that, and we maybe accomplish that goal, and our happiness level is either about the same, or probably even, you know, now we're still unhappy because there's it just this never ending cycle. And this is the same thing we find in marriage as well, is that we can focus on all these good, we want to be greater companions, we want to be better servants, or we want to be better lovers, we want to be better friends, we want to be better, whatever that thing is we're trying to accomplish the benefits, we can focus on those, but that's not really ever what gets us to where we want to go. We want to focus on something greater. Another reason why Satan showed up on the scene and wanted to mess up this beautiful thing called marriage and this partnership between a man and a woman, that's the one true way to bring the kingdom of God to earth and to model it is that our families are the foundation for every nation. We've seen this time and time again in history, and we're going to continue to see it play out. Whenever families start to fall apart, the overall structure of the country starts to fall apart and crumble. It's not the responsibility of government. It's not the responsibility of these other... There is no institution that's really tasked or created for making our people whole as the family itself. When families are not there, this isn't the message on family, right? But it's the idea that whenever families are there, and the reason why families are so important to look at is the idea that marriage is the foundation of every family. That we have to have a strong marriage in order for our families to truly thrive. So if we want to fight for the kingdom, we want to see the kingdom advance and grow, it starts in our own homes. Yes. It starts in our own relationships. Now you don't have to be married to extend the kingdom of God and rule and reign over the earth. That you can do amazing things. And we see that case laid out in the Bible as well. Paul saying like, you can do this, but God also put this, this desire in most of us to really want to do this with another person. Because there's just things that each, each of us need, whether we're male or female, that we look to the opposite gender. Which is also the reason why it has to be someone of the opposite gender for it to work. It has to be male and female. That's what makes a marriage. And that's what builds a secure, solid family structure. And that is becoming controversial statement to even say that I, if I make that solo case in my current job at Eastern, I would probably be written up in some form. 
if someone complained. Like so, someone would have to complain, there's a pretty good chance. Now most of my students are pretty pretty solid, so don't lose hope for all of humanity from what you see in the news about college students, because most of my college students are pretty pretty level-headed and they're they're on board with this. There's only just a few. The problem is, is that we have a lot of very few people that are not on board with this that are very, very vocal. And we're not very vocal. And we don't really do a whole lot. Because we get so caught up on I want the benefits. I want to have a happy marriage. And we don't really think about what are we truly accomplishing? What, what legacy are we leaving behind? What dominion are we really taking for the kingdom of God through our marriage? Because it's not just about us. When we see those stories about Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, or any person in a position of authority on a TV show, we look at the, the, the family structure of lives and how they do things. There's a lot of sacrifices that are being made in order for them to live out those roles. So that's why it's very easy to not step into positions of dominion and positions of authority. Because it's going to take time. It's going to put more pressure on your relationship. Which, well, if there's more pressure on our relationship, then we obviously won't be happy. And that's the whole reason why my mindset of why our marriage exists. And so we're going to, we're going to keep staying in this cycle as long as we live out that way and thinking that way. Rather than thinking that what's truly going to make us happy is when we're kicking butt together. When we're really doing something impressive together as a couple, that's when we look at it and say, like, yeah, this is exciting, and we're doing things together. And as husbands, we think, well, I, want to, I want to be protective, I want to, I want to focus on my wife, I want, I want to make life hard on her, I want to try to keep her from all that extra drama and tension, and that's good, but she also wants to have a life that's notable, and that means something as well. She wants to be married to someone that's that's accomplishing something as well. So yeah, as husbands, that's our responsibility is to go out and take territory, and not just go out and say, oh, we're, just, we're just gonna run, we're gonna take territory, keep up with me, because that's not it either. It's, we're gonna do this thing together. What mountain we're supposed to go after together? What is it on the earth right now that looks more like hell than heaven that you and I are not happy about? We wanna see that change. And then let's go after that thing together. That's what marriage looks like. That's what the kingdom of God is looking like. So all of a sudden these ideas of, now it's important to learn how to do this better we're doing a marriage Bible study and workshop together about how to go out living together well and understand the needs each one of us have. And we can still do all that and have a much better relationship but still miss all of this and still live lives that don't really make that big of a difference in the world. And that's not success. Success is that. Success is that we're really expanding the kingdom. In Ephesians chapter 5, it also talks about this idea as it describes the roles of husbands and wives. And it ends up with this one of these verses towards the end. This, this mystery is great. He's been describing marriage this entire time. It's a great mystery. But I'm also speaking with reference to Christ and the church. One of the greatest ways to demonstrate what the kingdom of God really looks like for people is through our relationships. That people should be able to look at us in the way that we treat our spouse and say, I want to know that, I want to know those people because they love each other so well. And that we should be able to model what Jesus' love for us looks like because we're, we're referred to in the Bible as the Bride of Christ, that Jesus is the groom, all of us collectively are the Bride, and He's seeking us out, and He's preparing us, and there's going to be this great wedding feast, everything. That, that's our role. Do our marriages look like that? As husbands, are we modeling how Jesus treats us collectively as a whole? And as wives, are we showing the undying respect and just preparation towards our husbands that we should be having waiting for Jesus to come back? And just the excitement of that. That there's a great, um, there's a big ask on both of us to be able to model this well. That's, that's the measure of success as well. So it's not just that we're living out our purpose, but that we're actually going out 
and doing that in the way that we're living up. Because it'd be easy to get fired up and say, all right, we've got one life to live, YOLO, let's go for this thing. We're going to, husband and wife, we're going to go out, we're going to knock down the doors of hell, and we're going to do all this amazing stuff together. And you can do that, and you can completely destroy your marriage in the process of doing that. Because there's a lot of husbands and wives that have gone into ministering through a church in that particular capacity. Did you notice the change there? Did you catch that? No. We're all in ministry. Every single one of us. Regardless of where your paycheck comes from. Let's go back a few more slides just to drive this point home, right? Every single one of us is tasked with taking dominion over the earth and extending the kingdom of God. I don't care how you do it. I do actually care a lot. But what title you give yourself as you're doing this doesn't change your responsibility. So whether you're a prison guard, a librarian, working in a factory, it doesn't matter what your role is. Every single one of us, this is our call. This is our responsibility. Extending the dominion of heaven to the earth. And if we're married, then we're doing this with someone else, which should just make it all the better. Because we get to do this together. We get to share those responsibilities and talk through those issues and bring something to that table that we haven't really, we couldn't do on our own. So a broader definition of marriage uh, from the Kingdom, Kingdom Marriage book of Tony Evans. It's a covenant between a man and a woman, once again, man and woman, replicating God's image and unity, expand his kingdom by their individual and joint callings. That it'd be easy to, there's so much to unpack in just kind of this description. Um, A covenant is something that's, you can't break it. It's established. Climate change, ice caps are melting, the world is going to get flooded. Is this something that we need to honestly be concerned about, according to the Bible? Even if you don't take science out of the question, even if it's current science, we look at it in the hard facts, says yes, all the ice is going to melt, and the world is going to get flooded again. Should we be concerned about this? Now, I'm queuing this up, think about the idea of a covenant. What covenants do we have regarding flooding? I need to go ask the kids. They should they'd be right on top of this, right? The rainbow. Every time it rains, we see a rainbow. God's given to that to us as a covenant, saying, I am never going to flood the earth and destroy it ever again. Now, may we have a sea level rise, we lose California. It's possible. I mean, some of us might not be too concerned about that. So I'm not saying that we might not have a change in sea level, that this might not happen. But also this idea that we do not need to fear a global flood again. Biblically, it's not, not something to be concerned about. Like, that's just ridiculous. So, there may be flooding. Once again, we are responsible for the earth. I also have this view that if we're trying to get back to the state of a Garden of Eden state and the earth is restored the way it once was, then yeah, the climate's going to be changing because the climate now is not what the climate was prior to the fall. That's a whole other study. We can dive into that. I don't have any other evidence for that, but that's just my personal view. Is that I expect climate change to continue. I think it should be. I think it's a sign of the kingdom coming and the earth restoring itself the way it once was. Anyways, just the idea that covenant is powerful. Covenant is something that we can bank on. It's not going to change. And our marriage is a covenant. It's something we should be able to bank on. That's how strong it is. And it's between husband and wife. And we're supposed to be expanding the kingdom of God in unity together with our individual callings, what we're good at individually, but also what we're good at together. What we bring to the table that we can't do by ourselves. In the book, it's interesting, he talks about when he, when he marries people and they do a unity candle. He asks them not to put the flame out on their individual candles. So light the unity candle, but keep both those flames burning. Because it's not like you totally lose yourself. You bring all of yourself. 
into your marriage. It just, you get better. And if something's happening to that unity candle and it does happen to flicker, one of you is responsible for relighting it. Which I thought was pretty cool. So don't put it out. Don't completely lose yourself and give up all of your uniqueness when you come into your marriage. But bring all that in, but also incorporate that newness that's a part of it as well. All right, sounds great. How do we do this, right? How do we actually make sure this happens and plays out? So there's some interesting things. Also found in Genesis, here we go. It's amazing what's all is in there. How do I actually live this out well? Now we don't have to go very far, we just go to the next chapter. So this is why a man leaves his father and mother, united to his wife, they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. That's all we need to know. <laughs> Which is pretty funny, just, uh, just basically look at the verse, I'm like, I'm, I think I'm missing a whole lot here. I mean, there's, I'm not seeing what you're seeing, because I didn't see this either. And this is the, the Bible study we've been going through as, as a small group of Monday nights. It's, it really, so much was kind of based on just these two verses alone of how to have that marriage that enables you to take dominion of the earth together. So there's four things that are actually hidden in these verses. Priority, pursuit, possession, and purity. And I'll go back and highlight that. Where do, how do you see these things in there? A man leaves his father and his mother. This is now the primary responsibility and the primary thing that I'm going to be making my decisions based off of is I'm now married and a wife leaves her parents and her family and says, I care about my mom and my dad and I'm going to honor them. But I can't do anything that's going to be jeopardizing this relationship outside of that. This is first and foremost. This is my priority. And we see a lot in many marriages, maybe even our own, is that there's a lot of things that happen where that is not the case. There is not this priority relationship between the husband and wife. Men get caught up in work, women get caught up in work, get caught up in family, hobbies, sports, commitments, responsibilities, whatever it is, comes in and all of a sudden that becomes identity, that becomes focus. And once again, we still have a purpose while we're seeking our greater relationship together, we're still seeking this advancing of the kingdom together in whatever profession, vocation that we have, we're living in our calling. We need to make sure that we're still focusing on each other in the process. The pursuit that we have, that we're united and we're really going after it, so that leave and cleave is another version that talks about, is that we're holding on to that other person in our relationship, saying, like, no, we are, we are together, we're unified. They're becoming one flesh. No longer is it, these are my things and those are your things, is that they're all together. We're all holding them in common. I don't have my own stuff, you don't have your own stuff. We have a combined purpose we're trying to live out, and all the things that we have, and everything that I'm doing, has an impact on you. Everything that you do has an impact on me. There's not the separation. And that purity, that we're able to do that in front of another person, completely naked, completely exposed, not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually, all those aspects of someone, to stand before someone and say, I am completely open, I will, I'm completely open to every suggestion that you have as to how I can become better, how I can do this walk in unity with you to live this out. And it's, we'll kill you. And that's the whole idea, is that it's intentionally designed to take that personal, selfish desires that we have and say, no, I'm laying myself down, I'm taking all the things that I've been gifted with, bringing that together with you, we're living this out together, but who I was before has made who I am now, it's this transformation that's happening. In our, in our lives and in our walks. So this idea, this connection between our marriages and what we do and how we do it in the kingdom of God, we can't separate them. 
And that's the problem is that we do separate them a lot. We do live a life where we focus a whole lot more on what we're trying to get out of it rather than saying, what is God asking us to do and how do we do that? So takeaways, all right, so what am I supposed to do with all this? Sunday message is over, check that box off, all right, good job, you're a good Christian. Sat through the sermon, fantastic, now we can go worship and then we'll go have lunch and then we'll start a week over again and change nothing. That's the common, common thing. Here's the challenge. The challenge is, what is your purpose? How are you going to change the world? What dominion are you supposed to be taking? And it has to start somewhere. What do you think? Yeah, so there's, there's a whole other sermon about there's all these different areas that we're called into. There's these aspects of culture and society that we're all supposed to be stepping into that have influenced everything. So business and arts and the religious mountain and family, government, education, media. There's all these areas of the society that desperately needs us to step into them. And we need to. And as a husband and wife, we may tackle one of them together. We may be tackling several of them. And there may be one that one spouse tackles more than the other, but then you might need to be Prince Albert at times. And so there's aspects of something that your, your wife is called to conquer, you support her, you stay behind her, and you help her to be able to accomplish that. And then every other scenario of monarchy where maybe the king taking responsibility and women step behind your husband and support him in doing that, help them to take dominion over that area. But the first one's probably gonna be your own house. <laughs> taking dominion and authority of your own home. That has to, it has to extend out of there. Because we, we go off trying to take dominion over something, and our family's not ready for it, our marriage isn't ready for it. We're supposed to be doing it, but once again, it's this priority thing. So God knows what you need to do and when you need to do it. But that's the challenge, is to spend time this week, this next month, this season, really asking God, all right, what is our purpose? What is we supposed to be doing? How do we live this thing out? And that's all I've got for today. I'm so, um, we're going to go into a time of worship and giving back to God through tithes and offering and then also through worship. And so the scripture um, that I had today for offering comes out of 1 Timothy chapter 6. And it says, to all the rich of this world, and I know sometimes we don't always feel rich, but if you compare us to some other countries, I think we probably all really classify as that. To all the rich of this world, I command you not to be wrapped in thoughts of pride over your prosperity or to rely on your wealth, for your riches are unreliable and nothing compared to the living God. Trust instead in the one who lavishes upon us all good things, fulfilling our every need. Remind the wealthy to be rich in remarkable works of extravagant generosity, willing to share with others. And that's one of the things that we've done as a church recently. We've been sharing with others. Um, I know you guys are aware, a few weeks ago we gave the gift cards out to the Foundry. And then this last week, as the Foundry was officially closing, um, we also brought them a meal. Um, and it was just to just meet them where they are. We felt like when the Foundry was closing, Oh, we felt like God said just to bless the people that work there. And so that's what we did. And so generosity can look different. Um, sometimes it is as simple as buying Starbucks for the person, the car behind you, or McDonald's, or whatever it is. Or even just complimenting somebody. How simple can that be? But that's also a generous thing that we can do to offer uh, back to God. And so we're going to have the kids come in with us to worship. Let me go ahead and just pray a prayer over the uh, offerings today. So God, we just come to you with what we have. 
and you're so generous. The way you multiply what we give you is just a beautiful thing. So God, we just offer this time to you. We offer this worship to you. We offer what sacrifices we have. Not because we want more from you or we expect more from you, but in thanks for who you are and what you've done. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name. I'm going to have you stand for worship. I do want to say we've been experimenting lately with having the kids come in for worship. Um, and But the child's space is all open. So if you feel like your kids going a little off the deep end, you're more than welcome to take them over to the kids' space as well. That's totally fine. Thank you. 
never stop working. He never stop. He never stop working.
strength to be able to do just that. The strength to be able to die to ourselves, love one another, to die to ourselves and say that we want to be able to use our marriage, we want to use our family to be able to be a blessing to people around us, to our neighbors and co-workers. people that serve us and waiting us provide us with goods and services. We'd have our eyes open. We'd just be hearing what you're saying and doing. That you can build your kingdom through us. So I say yes, Lord, we release this over all of us to be able to make this true. That we'd see it happen. So help us to carve out extra time this week. Remind us just to ask you as we just pour out visions and pictures and ideas and thoughts, dreams, bring dreams back to life of things that we wanted to accomplish as a couple. And bring new dreams into our lives. And all the limitations we placed on whether it be time or finances or debt, our own relationship or our emotional state, all the things we said, the reason why it can't happen or it won't happen, that we be to see all those things through your eyes. That we'd see everything that's in front of us through your eyes, Lord. And that we wouldn't live with limits on ourselves, we wouldn't live with limits on our marriage, we wouldn't live with limits on our home or our families. Thank you. 